Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Back to another show and this week we've got a special edition for you, uh, joined by two very special guests, um, a good friend, Glenn Hicks obviously ex-Premier League Academy coach, and Paul McGuinness, uh, who worked for over 20 years at Man United, top, top uh, player developer and coach developer, also worked with the FA. Uh, I was speaking to Paul the other day on the phone, we were chatting about his new concept flow in football, talking about that, how that re- uh, relates to 1v1 skills and many other things as well. So I thought it'd be a great idea to get him on the show, back on the show, because he's been on already, have a bit of a chat, a bit of a roundtable chat with myself and Glenn about flow in football, how to coach it, how to identify it, and yeah, so just going to do a bit more content like this as well, just some more chats with some top player developers, uh, just a little bit different from the usual interview about their career one. But uh, it was a really good little chat. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And remember, look, if you want to um, find out more about myself and Paul and Glenn, you know, we've all done presentations on the My Personal Football Coach Virtual Academy. Check the link in the uh, <coughs> in the contents. Uh, sorry, uh, check out presentations from all of us and also some of the best player developers in world football. But like I said, and also, if you listen to this or watching this on the coach coaching family podcast uh channels now the coaching family podcast channel is going to be myself and glenn are going to be here on the mpfc one now so we're just going to try and align those but without further ado let's get into the show so guys welcome everyone to a special episode of the my personal football coach uh coach development podcast uh joined tonight with uh, two very special guests good friend glenn hicks and also Paul McGuinness, ex-Man United coach and worked to the FA as well. And obviously a friend of the show has been on the show before. So welcome to the show, lads. Great. Good to be here. Talking football. That's what we want. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, looking forward to this one, Saul. Fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, we were chatting the other day, Paul, and I thought it would be a good idea <laughs> to get you on. Obviously, seen you uh, a lot of your recent work on Twitter before you got suspended, by the way. Yeah, so, you know... <laughs> The I think, it's, yeah, so, I think. I yeah, don't know so, uh, how long it is yet. Free, free Paul McGuinness hashtag, you know. Yeah. So hopefully you're back on Twitter. But I thought we used to come on because you're chatting about this idea about the flow, flow of the game. And we were chatting the other night and we were talking about, you know, 1v1 skills and, but I mean, uh, and about how that is the coming. So I thought it'd be nice anyway to have a general chat about this and about, you know, technical development and stuff like that anyway. So just give the, the people who don't know, who are not lucky enough to have seen some of your work on Twitter already about your idea about flow and where that come from and a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Well, I just hopefully I hope this is, this is not like hearty, but a real sort of a chance to speak with football people and, and throw some ideas about. I'm not sure about these ideas because, you know, it, it might be too far away from what people have grown up with thinking about football. It might not really fit with their prior experience or what have you. Um, but in, in, in delving in more deeper, since since I had time really since when, when you're in football as you know 20 odd years at Man United you're just you're just doing all the time and we do we'd had, had great chats with Jim Ryan there at Man United and lots of other people I was always thinking but you are so busy you, you're on the treadmill and anybody in football will it'll resonate with them that because you're just going for the next game the next training the next thing's popping up so it's hard to really think and, and get some ideas without someone sort of saying, well, just behave yourself, put the ball away or whatever it is, you know? So in that sense, I've had a lot of thinking time the last few years. And and, and it, the more you see in different models, you, you, you hear about football, about the DNA, and you've got obviously principles of play, and then somebody else brings out some new language. Um, so you, you sort of, I was really thinking, how do we make this really simple for, for the kids? From the player's eye view, how do you give them language that they can maybe feel and see um, and that works? And maybe the grassroots coach who, who, who's heard all the words but doesn't really know what they mean necessarily, but also might resonate with the top players of of, of how they actually play the game. Um, so, yeah, I just thought to myself, uh, well, it was actually, I was on a course with, Leeds Beckett University as well there was a PG diploma course when we were at the FA and it was going right what is the game you know what is the game if you had to explain it simply to someone what would it be and more recently I've been saying well if it was starting me and you in the back garden uh, or in the park against Glen um, uh, you had the bench for the goal I've got the garden gate 
or I'd have to I'd have to flow past you or to the side of you and make the ball flow in my in your goal, and you would do the same. Um, I think we were just talking a bit earlier. If a load of Martians came down off down from Mars and we're looking at what's going on, think, wow, how do all these people watch this game? What is it? Millions of people interested in it. Thousands there creates great emotion. What is it though? It looks it, it's it's both complex but simple. It might look to them like a game of blow football. You're just trying to use force, the right amount of force to play the ball close enough and connect, carry the ball, dribble it, run with it, pass it, connect with each other and, and put it in the other goal, you know, make it flow past the goalkeeper. Um, and in that sense, the defenders would be trying to block that flow, block it flowing forward, divert it away from the goal, get their body in between and, and virtually steal the flow for themselves. Um, and, and by sort of thinking about it in that way, it's helped me analyse key interactions in the game and say, well, how have they gained advantage in flow um, in that situation? And there's, there's, there's all different ways ways to look at it. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's the sort of idea behind yeah. what, what I've been Inter doing. Interesting, because yeah, I mean, I, I, we were talking the other day and, and we you know, we said about when you watched, said something on, the, you said on Twitter about, you know, that you said when, you know, when you're sort of going against the flow, so creating the goal scoring opportunity so that, you know, that, that maybe that reverse pass, for example, you know, mm where it goes against. And I was thinking a lot, you know, we chat the other night about 1v1 skills. You said, you know, that's, you know, when you're trying to beat a player, you know, you're going against their flow. And I look at someone like, for example, Grealish, where he's so good, you know, he's so good and boy has his own flow, but where he goes past players, you know, sort of yeah. against that energy, I thought it was a really interesting concept. And I think I like it, like, you know, because it's just a different way to look at the game and depicted about development and sort of like, you know, particularly in those attacking moments, I suppose it's defensive as well, but look at those attacking modes, how you can sort of unbalance and unsettle teams and, you know, unbalance individuals mm. as well with that sort of flow. Glenn, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the whole thing about like a block, whether it's a one-man block, a 1v1 or um, a five-man uh, back four or five to break down or the whole team and a low block, there's only three or four ways to get around them. You either go over, round, or through. And it's about finding that path. And it's really interesting what tools you use, whether you're a dribbler like Grealish or you're going to cut someone open like Bush gets with a bit of disguise and the way he'll look one way and then turn his hips and just pull a pass on the inside when everyone's stepping that way. It's really interesting. And a lot of it, I think, is just loads of different types of reverse plays because everyone just thinks of a reverse pass. But reverse plays, whether it's a reverse finish or a little back heel or, like you say, a quick change of direction. Simon Sinek said something the other day, I see just popped up on Twitter or somewhere, about skiers and about going down and focusing on the trees. But if you focus on not hitting the trees, you're already focusing on the trees. But he's he worded it as focus on the path, focus on the path and focus on the snow. And it's probably similar to, to football in terms of where's the space, that might be the snow, where's the grass, and the defenders are just obstacles, but it's it's fascinating way of looking at it in terms of a simple go against the flow because that's pretty much what you're doing. Apart from on in skiing, the pathway is always the same. In football, as we know, it's constantly changing, and that I think is is the ultimate challenge, isn't it? And, and finding the right way and the right time to to go against the flow, as it were, to coin uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, would, I would say as well, it, it, it's not just going against the flow, but just controlling the flow to gain advantage. Um, so you, you're thinking if like if I'm taking on on Walker from the the Kyle Walker, I've got no, well not many people have got a chance, you know, with going with going with just speed. But if you stop and start, you stop and start, and you control the flow in that way, he's really quick. He's chasing you quick. He's got to decelerate quick, and then so you can beat him in the transition of flow. So by controlling that flow, you you'll be you're beating him with a rhythm. I think as well. So it's not just reversing against the flow. It's in terms of the, it could be the biomechanics of it. You, you get him into one footwork um, set. So you might get him um, dragging it, dragging it, and he's got to side skip. And then you go a bit quicker. Now he's got a crossover step. And then all of a sudden you stop. Well, he might get caught crossover step and be on the wrong foot. And now you might, you might come inside him and, and those sort of things. So I think it's just, yeah, looking at all, it can be the rhythm and not just individual, it can be the team. So I had a really good coaching mentor at Man United, Jim Ryan, who was, yeah, very much into disguise and rhythm and and, and, and a lot of detail on that side. So we would do a lot of work in and around the penalty area, um, what I call the play around arc, trying to, trying to move their defence, loosen their defence up 
So loosen up that block, like you say, to flow through it. Um, and Jim, Jim had a, some really good sayings. So um, one of them would be change the rhythm. So a lot of the passing around there is control pass, control pass, control pass, because you're trying to move the ball quickly to see an opening around. And what that does is it gets their defence into a rhythm of, so as it gets played up and you control, a man comes up, you control pass, he goes back, someone else comes up, next one goes up, control pass, he's up. So they get in a rhythm. And then Jim would say, we'll change the rhythm. So you might change the rhythm with, yeah, a reverse it against the flow. So they got they go in the opposite way. Or you might change it in... Um, in a tempo, change your rhythm. So it'd be control, pass, control, pass, control, pass, 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 pass. So that might upset the rhythm slightly, you know, of, of what they were doing. Um, and he, he did it in the sounds as well. He went, bum, 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 bum. And you can see how it can just, that just might get you the opening in um, an, an unsettle the rhythm of they're up, they're back, they're up, they're back, um, that type of thing. So it, yeah, I can I can see that. Say so you can see that sort of going across the pitch, can't you? And then you may be cut inside them. Um, another one. I was dead lucky with this one because uh, I went after I left Man United. I, I was lucky. I got a chance to go to UEFA doing some a couple of presentations to the pro license Neon, and um, the, just at the time, Claude McAuley was there. Just I think he was just observing, but I ended up at the sort of. The, the coaches, like the coach educators, having a meal. So I sat next to him. I thought, well, I'll sit next to him and get the get the most out of this. So I was quizzing him all about different stuff, and he was telling me about he was always in a triangle with with my, uh, with uh, John Terry and Carvalho defending and so on. But he said on the attacking then, if if um, Lampard went forward, he filled in. But then the, the really interesting little one he said was, yeah, when he was young, he was at Celta Vigo. And um, and the coach had him as a defensive midfield player just after training, every day after training, uh, receive it from the left, control it with his right foot or play with his left or control it with his left, play with his right. So changing the play. So you see that rhythm where everybody's he's going to get it out there and make it flow to the other side. And he said after a few weeks, he started to not only do that, but tell him as the ball came into him, go back towards the ball with his first touch and then play it out the other way. And it took me a bit to sort of figure out what it was. But I think that, again, is like disrupting the flow of the defence. They're all seeing it fly, slide across. Mm. They're all on the way. The far fullback's going out to the... Ready on his way to the winger. But as soon as McAuley takes that touch back, they've all got to stop. You know, they've all got to put the brakes on because he's going back the other way. And that, at that point, they they might not coordinate that all at the same time. One might stop, one might carry on. Once you know, and the fullback who was on his way already on the run to get to the winger, he's now had to stop ten yards in, and he's he's now he's now got to flow back out to that that guy. So it's just gaining slight advantages with with sort of playing with the flow, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great point, isn't it? I think we talk a lot about unbalancing teams. And how can we unbalance teams? So obviously, you know, a lot of my work and a lot, it's like the work you've done as well, Paul, is about unbalancing those individuals because if you, you know, once you unbalance that individual, then it creates the opportunity to unbalance a team, right? So it's like we talk, you know, a lot about, I talk a lot about, you know, that those, those movements before the ball comes, you know, faking yeah. before you receive like Modric or those players or Tony Cruz, mm. you know, those angles, those movements disguised to, you know, yeah. break pressure, break the immediate pressure, break the flow, if you like, and then boom, that, you know, that successful 1v1, then it opens up the opportunities to, to you know break lines and then unbalance those teams i mean mm. think about that then i mean in terms of like coaching and development then is this something then you know is this an idea that you want to sort of like introduce to close coaches and say like do you think that's is do you think that's a, a good way an effective way to communicate that to players maybe you know you're talking about because for me that mm. makes sense speaking of the, the 1v1 yeah. the individual like you know unbalancing there to to break the flow to go because we always talk about unbalancing movements to mm. To unbalance first and then to then exploit it sort of seems like yeah. a sort of quite well, easy I, notion I, to pick I, the way I start it with say more novice coaches or any coaches anyway really to reinforce it but with with young players and coaches exactly what Glenn said before about you, you can either go over you go around or you go through so quite often I just start with the British Bulldog you know tag the one guy's in the middle the other's got to get round 
So, okay, starts off. And then, you know, he, he chases one. And everybody else who's looking from the other side, they can just walk across. They can just jog across. So I would say they've gained advantage in the flow of information. They look at his head. They see he's going the other way. They see there's no chance of getting caught. And you could refer that then to a winger or anybody running in blindside of someone later on. But that basic principle kids are doing at eight, nine years of old without really any coaching. Probably what happens is we get the ball out and we do all sorts of different drills and we we take their attention away from that. So that's something that happens naturally in the playground, you know, does we have to teach it then. Um, but if you do that game and obviously they get more more defenders then, so it's more difficult to get through. So now you find someone who like absolutely sprints on the outside. You know, he just gets a curving run and, and goes on the outside. Well, that happens in a match as well. <laughs> And then the other guy who, who like starts to run and the defender chases him and then he puts the brakes on and he flies off the other way. You know, the, the defense, that's opposite flow. So these are all things I think a lot of people who've played that game, I hope they play it still, <laughs> used to play it all the time when we were a kid. If they've played that game in the park, your average mom or dad who might be helping taking the team, that's the starting point. So well, football's quite like that, really. So you might not be looking for some of the absolute technical detail of some, some bits, but that bit, they can see, uh, oh, yeah, you, you didn't beat him because you didn't run fast enough so that when you stopped, he'd go flying past and you'd lose him, you know? So try running faster. And if he doesn't catch you, uh, you know, you're in. And if he does catch you, well, you put your foot on it and now he goes flying past and now you go the other way. It's, you know, it's change of direction. Um, interesting. Simple. And, <laughs> and Hicks, Glenn, anything on that? Yeah, it's interesting. When you, when you think about the concept as well, how you individualise as well. So players that spring to mind are the obvious orchestrators in midfield like Zidane, you know, either have everyone playing to what tempo, rhythm of the game. We just orchestrate the whole game. And the game against Brazil in the World Cup years ago shows that. And then you've got the Modric's. And for me, the master who never got, well, he's obviously got credit, but Xavi and Iniesta got credit before him. But Busquets, for me, is he's like a puppeteer, isn't he? And in terms of controlling tempo and flow, it's interesting, Paul said about, it's not just about reverse, it's about control the flow. And Busquets springs to mind because when the game needs to speed up and accelerate through the lines, he can change the tempo. When it needs to just, hey, like, calm down, you know, let's just keep it. And, and it completely dictates. But when you can think about it in context with wingers there's obviously different styles as well because you might get a St Maximin where actually he seems to be at his best when he's got up to speed and then it's just multi-directional it might be that way but then the Grealish is in the armories of this world they used to go to zero almost standing still didn't they that walking kind of arrogant I'm going to completely control this and stop almost pulls like the matrix and then they just switch it on and it's it's fascinating how to put it into each context for each individual because like anything like with a dribbling or, or retaining the ball it's always going to look slightly different for each individual based on their capacity. So I'll keep trying to bring it back to, okay, what does it look like for even a goalie, for an Edison to control the flow of a game? Um, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. And I'm just trying to bring it back to the context for individuals that we work with. And Yeah. yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. Said, I said, Paul, you said as well, like that bulldog, but it could be anything, right? So you're working on the Rondo, you know, with a 5v2, one in the middle or something, or like a positional game. Same principle, isn't it, I suppose, you know, that's the thing, control the flow of the rhythm, like you say, slow, slow, yeah. slow, quick pop, break speed, you know, break lines, split passes, that sort of thing. I suppose that's yeah, the and then, to bring that concept in. Yeah, I think I heard you the other day on, on, on one of the podcasts saying, well, that's where you get a lot of the, um, the real sort of basic fundamentals of, of pass and move football starting off as a little basis, mm -hmm. not moving very far, but you're given another angle and so on. And then that's where, in terms of the technique, I, I would be then saying, well, the flow is vital, you, you know, if you bobble that pass to your mate, it, it's not easy for him to look up and he, you can't control it as well. So make sure every pass is smooth, but then also if we want flow, play in front of them to the foot where they're going to go forward. So the flow of the movement there and everything, we're all looking and we're all on the same wavelength just off a simple idea. You know, we want to flow forward. We can't always flow forward. Sometimes we've got to come back. Uh, as long as we know why we're doing that, quite often that, if we come back and then square, and this reminds me of, um, this is from the 1950s, by the way, from my dad in the Busby Babes. The manager was, uh, the, the, well, he was the Welsh manager, but the youth team manager and assistant manager was a guy called Jimmy Murphy. And he had some little rules of thumb. 
which you can imagine it on the pitches in the old days what it was. But he, he said if if you pass back or square, if you play play two passes back or square, the next one should go forward. Now that's not like an absolute rule, but what it really means is if you've gone back, you're loosening off the pressure. So that now if they come out to you, there'll be gaps vertically in between you. If you play it square, you'll have opened up a gap and loosened them up there. So you should be really be looking to go forward, not pass another one back or square. It's not to say you can't do it, but it's a nice little rule of thumb that I think was was a part of what we want to be going forward. We want to flow forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot then in the technical aspects of it to say how do you get um, a flow so you i've seen your stuff uh, loads of great stuff where where they'll do put two or three moves together so won't they so so in that sense it's the connections the, the transfer between each move how good is that where they move between one move to the next mm. you know so you can think of Harry Kane is just such a master. And he, he, he comes inside, takes his touch inside. He's got to bend it to that far post. But then the guy comes across to block it. And now he chops it back. But he's already into the next move to hit it with his left foot because it's almost like that's one movement because he's so good at transitioning. Because he's got the idea he's got to be quick. The flow's got to be efficient. And now he smacks it with his left foot to the far post, you know, or through the keeper's legs mm. or something. So, so getting that transition right and that flow right and realistic was another thing I've, i remember i see lots of kids out on their own practicing um and it's great to see but they'll have a touch out of the feet they'll have a look up and then they'll try and place it in the far corner and you think yeah but if, a, if there's a defender there you wouldn't be doing that you've got to do it quicker mm -hmm. so yeah. it's understanding the flow between each action you know or each interaction yeah yeah, I mean, you mentioned the skill combination where, I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely come to think of it. I mean, that is about the flow of the body. I'm a big advocate of that, developing mm. not only the technique, but the body for the modern game. You know, those movements, mm. those explosive movements and, you know, helping players go left and right and left again. You mm. know, it's almost like, you know, we talk at Tottenham a lot with Chris Ramsey about the rodeo, you know, being on the rodeo and, you know, be able to shake defenders off, you know, to, yeah. you know, to have that movement on both sides. I think it's really undervalued really? and really underappreciated yeah. that having Don't that. The ability to, like you say, go both sides and shake, you know, watching that have a, have a Donna, the Napoli player, you know, the, the mm -hmm. other day and watching him score the way he cuts and goes one way, comes the other way with such explosive forward movement. It's like, yeah. I think that's interesting though, isn't it? Like you said, and then you mentioned it earlier, but you look at the individual way, how you approach it. And then you look at the team way, you know, that team coaching. And I suppose it's this overriding, you know, philosophy, if you like, a mentality about flow, isn't it? And sort of keep yeah, I think so. And you, once you start yeah, to look at it, you look at the physical aspects, like you say, like I, I was at a club the other week and we were trying to do, we were working on it. It was good. It was good the way it progressed, working on one touch finishes. Um, but then, you know, I was with the coaches and we were observing, yeah, anytime something popped up though, they, they struggled, you know, above waist height. Um, mm -hmm. They were a bit stiff. I mean, they were, they were 13, 14. So, so, you know, they, they can be stiff at that age group, but, if you remember, you remember the work, was it Roger Spry who did a lot of work, sort of athletic work with high, getting high feet and really like the Brazilians, getting your feet high so that you can volley it. I mean, I yeah. think of Mark Hughes, watching Mark Hughes as a young player, just a couple of years below him at Man United, him and Clayton Blackmore, overhead kicks daily, you know, practicing them. And of course, he, he was unbelievable. So the ability to rearrange your body quickly, you think of the Rooney overhead kick where... Yeah. The cross came in, but it got a deflection. So he's set for one effort and then it moves and he can he can quickly move. So I think the club, especially the pro clubs, who can you've got the time, the space, that should be half the job of the fitness guys and half the job of the technical guys together, you know, um volleys, overhead kicks, um, because then then you can control your body spatially in the air. No, like Harland's Harland's so. goal on the weekend. Yeah, that one exactly, mm. exactly that that goal or a header where you've got to move your body. So they've got all the equipment now, you know, mats and all this stuff. I'd have it on maybe just like a a, a round robin where you just move round. Um, which is where I was fortunate as a kid. I had a dad who played, you know, played football top level, so he I had I had great service when mm. when I want, wanted crossing and heading. But he used to like doing the overhead kicks as well, my dad. You know, he used to do one where he, he'd dive forward, 
could you, you play it at his head, he'd dive forward onto his hands, do a handstand and then back heel it with a scissor kick over his head. And it was, when he caught it right, it was, it was amazing. But all those sort of things to me is like the top footballer. I think Arsene Wenger said this years, years ago, is they should be almost gymnastic mm. qualities as well as, as, as football. They should have both. But it goes to beg the question and how many times you see sessions like that in academy football or grassroots football, you know, you know, the, I remember one list of one of the boys, uh, one of the Liverpool boys, 16, said Pep Linder's first ever session in the academy was a uh, diving headers and overhead kicks. That mm. was the topic of the session. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He said it's the funniest session. It was mental. It was great. Everyone loved it. But do you think there's a fear in the current climate of saying, oh, you know, what are we doing that for? <laughs> well, the whole thing's about entertainment, isn't it? You know, you, you want entertainment. And if you want goals, the first thing you play football in the park, you're entertaining yourself. No coaches mm. there. You, you're just yeah. doing what you want to do, aren't you? I mean, it can help to to get you know a bit of good um, coaching on it because it is it does. If you get it wrong, you hurt your back, you know. So, but kids on a soft surface, it's just one of the joys of football. That overhead kicks, isn't it? Um, and and yeah, but again, it's it's you got to get the right flow of the body. If you're doing mm. an, an overhead kick with a scissor kick, you've got to get the first leg up almost as a guide, and the other one comes over, doesn't it? Um, Parlance was great the other day, yeah. really. Um, you know, it's it's the control of the body in the air, spatial control, which again I think goes back to how fluid is your movement, yeah, uh, and all those things. So you know, the technical things, volleying, volleying again is another sort of very fluid movement. You got to have control of your body, and you've got to like Glenn will say, you got to dip your shoulder down so that your knee, your thigh comes through, and your and your foot. So you're not hitting under the ball. Um, interesting. And, and Glenn, anything right to that? Yeah, it's interesting trying to connect a few dots here. Um, I'm thinking of team goals and putting the individuals into the team and looking at, like, there's a Real Madrid goal that Van Nistelrooy scored that volley where it was wonderful one-touch football, pop, 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 or, like, the cadence of the ball, like Paul was talking about earlier, the rhythm, the boom, 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 if you could hear the ball. And it was something like 12 to 15 passes, went from left to right, but it was one touch, unbelievable football. It was like you could play music to it and then Van Nistelrooy adjusts, similar to what Paul was saying, but it wasn't an overhead kick. I think the ball comes at him a bit, chokes him, and he makes a couple of backward steps and hit this unbelievable volley across goal. And then you've got the, the famous Jack Wilshire goal for Arsenal with Wenger. So whether it's a one-touch flowing game, what interests me is how, this is a question for all companies, I think this is something that's coached. It's not that it's coaching correctly. I think it's undercoached. How do you support the dribbler? Because I watch a lot of dribbling sessions where there's a lot of 1v1 dribbling and the game plays and then kids stand around just watching a dribbler. But really what helps Grealish or I'll use Messi as an example. I've seen so many goals of Messi down the years where the players around him know their job. We've got to support Messi. When he gets the ball, wherever he moves, we must respond. And there's that one where Busquets just drops it off from against Madrid, isn't there? And he literally stands out the way and says, go on. He blocks someone, I think, and says, go on, take them all on. And he does, and he scores that right foot goal against Madrid. But then there's other ones down the years where if he's with a Suarez or an Eto, you know, I think of in terms of any, like you're either pulling the back four, you're pushing them, or you're looking to penetrate in some way. Or like uh, Barcelona used to just pin players, right? So you've got them peas in there about how do we, how do we break these down? And it's interesting how do they support Messi? Because if you've got a Suarez, he might make a run in behind to take the centre half with him. And it's opened up the space for Messi to go in. Or he's got Danny Alves on the overlap, which is, you can all see it now, can't you? The defender takes that one backward step and he's got him on the inside. It's just, it's, there's different ways. And this whole flow thing is about, a lot of it is to do with connectivity, isn't it? And timing and I think that's where the difficulty lies when it comes to putting it together as the team. I think there's lots of really good individual moments we see, especially the likes of Jack Grealish and these wonderful players we watch. But it's like, how do you connect the dots? Like, I'm watching St Maximum the other day and I'm thinking to myself in my head, I wouldn't be sure how to support him. I'm, well, I'm not a good enough player anyway, but because of the unpredictability with his game, it, it's it's hard to, how do you support that? Do we just keep responding off him? Do you know what I mean? So, it's kind of like, how do you get the connectivity? And then most, more importantly, how do you coach it? Are we encouraging the right movements and to, to, to build that flow within the team, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, yes, that's, it's like per, per play. I, I work with a, a right back in, in one of the championships and his one of the strongest points is dribbling, 1v1 dribbling. And now, you know, one of the coaches now is trying mm. to get one of the players to make a, like an underlapping run diagonally into the corner. And he's this new thing. We're saying, you know, he's just, this guy's whole strength of his game is to be able to dribble and get on the outside and beat players. 
but now the coach, you know, it's a tactical thing anyway. But that you say, I suppose, how you you uh, you support players. To, yeah, I you know, think that's com- that. being understanding the com um, how they complement each other. So then a good flow of uh, the best managers say. So if you think of Nigel Clough, uh, not Nigel Clough, but obviously Nigel Clough is very good as well, don't worry, but his dad, um, you know, the teams he had, you know, everybody would would look at them and go, well, they're not quite this, and these are a bit of journeyman player, or he's this, or he's that. But he had them perfectly connected. He had them complemented. So you had John Robertson came deep on the left, and then they played balls down the side for Bertels coming through. So all the connections were complemented. So this is another part of what you do. I think you need you need to you need to see who complements who, you know. And that's obviously what Guardiola is doing for whichever game. He's saying, well, they he, take for instance the game, the game they won seven. I was at the game, and the pressing won the game. I know they won, I scored all the goals, but they couldn't get out from their normal shape. And he and he explained later that he'd, instead of Mares, he'd played Bernardo Silva because he was the best at blocking the flow and forcing the flow back in a certain way. And then they picked all the pieces up. So it's both attacking and defending, but also understanding who complements who. So, you know, you think of great partnerships over the years. Keegan and Tosha, there you go. How they could, how did that? Shearer and Sheringham for England. You know, Beardsley complemented... Um, Lineker, 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 you know, and he Lineker. always says Cole, that he's the yeah. best one for me because he's coming short and playing past. So it's it's both uh, how do they complement each other and then understanding. So if the other team, I call it, you know, in the flow, the the the, the defensive individual's got his own individual force field. So that's why Walker's in the City team because his force field is bigger than anybody else's. He can get further and quicker than anyone else to stop things and cover. So he's, he's like holds the whole side up, doesn't he, for the defence. So each one will have a different um, force field and they'll try and the way you connect those force fields is whether they can get through or not, isn't it? But at the very top level, and you see, of course, City, you see doing it all. This, the idea of the, of the false nine is to pull one of them out. And when that, it's almost like he, he leaves a vacuum within the force field that now people are sucked into to make, to make the runs. So you can see it. You can see a way that happening, even even to the extent, say, it's happened a few times now. Grealish carries the ball inside. He runs with it inside, and it's almost like he's the vessel for the flow at that time. And then as he comes inside, in his wake, he's left like a whole calm. And the fullback goes in the calm. They reverse the ball back out to him, and he's in the space. So there's this filling of spaces. You know, because someone's moved the flow, I think, and, and moved the, the 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 force field of the defenders. I'm only using those words to think, well, if, if I'd never played the bloody game and I hadn't had width, depth, you know, mm. creativity, all these things put into my mind, if you see, yeah, oh, I can see that. He's just moved out of that space. And he's, he's you know, he's, he's been attracted by the defender. Um, well, here's one for you, Paul. What about this third man running? Third man runs. Yeah, Let's talk that, about that, something going breaking the flow. That's, that's got to be the, the well, uh, epitome of it, right? Well, I was I was lucky to work with uh, Graham Carrick at the FA. So you know, I had a long time, loads of years at Man United. So we had our own particular ways. But West Ham had their own particular ways mm. for just as long. You know, with all you know, with Carrick and Ferdinand and um, Joe Cole and all of those, and and all the you know before that with Hurst and. And more and and all that, Peters. Um, so they they def and when you played them, you you, you were always knew it was going to be a good game. You were always thinking, what are they? What is it they're exactly doing? You know. And he was he was telling me. And then we had um, Tony Carr come mm-hmm. to some of the FA talk at the FA. He's done it. I've got twenty pages of notes on Tony Carr saying the same speech, but always getting something else out of it. And some of the most simple things. Uh, well, it seems simple, you know. Oh, it's three players. He did did, did a warm up, three player warm up, you know. Third man runs with nobody there. Oh, that's simple. There's no opposition. Yeah, but to get the time and the appreciation mm. of the detail that he got into them, and it, I think it's on the FA website. Uh, uh, M- Michael Carrick talking about third man runs. And he's yeah. talking you know, all the detail about laying the ball square, getting blind side of your man. The next man plays the ball up quick for the strike who's come off on an angle, and you run across the. You don't run. You run behind the line of the man, and so. 
and the first time set is the trigger for the run. So these little rules of thumb start to come up. So that was definitely a West Ham one. The first time set, so the flow of everything, the decisions of when to run is if he can play it back. And another one is, you know, leave the ball playable first time. So if mm. you leave that put first pass playable first time, he sets it first time. That's the trigger for the run. Mm. Um, Interesting, because, I mean, yeah, obviously, same to West Ham, Ajax, Barcelona, pivotal part of their methodology, the third man running. You know, they most sessions have something in there. Also, our good friend, uh, Paul Noddy Holder, Lucky enough yeah. to work with him a little bit down at Crawley at the beginning of the season. He's talking about this as well, about same sort of flows. As soon as the ball goes backwards, comes backwards mm. us, we should be looking to play forwards because they're coming, you know, there's space mm. in behind in those pockets. So he's talking about a lot and also about driving across the field, you know, drawing people out to then yeah. try and play beyond. And he's uh, obviously, you know, how good Paul is, a really interesting guy, actually. Trying to get on the podcast, but the same sort of principle about, you know, trying to break that flow, right? With those those four mm. passes, I was going, going back to then go forward. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, yeah, you, I think you can slowly build it up, the technical ideas uh, and so on. So, hey, oh, no secrets now. You, you won't mind me saying it, um, uh, Tony Carr. I, I, I asked him with Graham, I said, well, how did you do it? You know, third man runs. He said, oh, it takes years. He said, but he said, I started off, and, and we've all probably done this one years ago, but he had the... He had the gumption to to keep it and repeat it as a foundation practice. So three of you in a line, first one plays to his mate on the outside and then goes outside him. He plays first time on the, and plays it to his mate on the outside and goes around him. So you just do a, like a, a basketball three-man weave. Right. Now that sounds simple, but to get it right with both feet and to do it quick is not easy. But mm. what it's already doing is teaching them the idea we need to be flowing forward. So the weight of the pass needs to be exactly right. The accuracy needs to be right to play onto his right foot there to get the rhythm to play in front. So I said, well, how long do you do that? I said, do it till they really get the idea and they get the, the really, he's what he's really doing. He's making that a habit to have mm. the flow perfect, the weight. I mean, also, you, you, we were talking about scanning earlier, just before we came on, about you're mm. going to do a social scanning. I mean, that is scanning, isn't it? I mean, yeah, looking up, scanning right, you know, yeah. Well, it's also like, where's the third man? Where's the where's the run? You know, where's the, third, where's the third pass? So when I'm That's playing, it. when it's, when the ball comes back, I'm already looking, not only if I'm the passer, am I the third man? Am I the one running beyond? So that's, you know, exactly. really about scanning, not like, you know, yeah, that's, but that's both reality things. of the game, isn't it? Yeah, the weight of it. Then then he said, well, once I got them all right, he said I used to then make it into a triangle. So one went to the front instead of a flat line. So now you play now you play to the guy at the front. He plays back to the other man, and now you can make the forward to the man run. And then he start, turn around and start it all again. And, and then there's oh, obviously lots of different ways you can make a third man. You can run between them. You can you can get all different ways. But he slowly built it up like that. But you can see how the first exercise meant, yeah, he's playing forward with the right weight the second man now plays back with the right weight and so now it's just building up i call this type of learning is like uh it's like computer game learning you you make you give them an easy principle give them let them get them get success let them see that success now make it a little bit more difficult now a bit more difficult and um you know he said that's that's slowly how they built it up and he was doing it with well it was pretty successful because <laughs> frank lampard looked one of the best in the world i say wasn't he yeah, interesting. Ben, anything to add to that? There's a lot of, um, I, I think, patterns of play have always been like, yeah, patterns of play, patterns of play. But the thing is with patterns of play is any pattern can become predictable eventually. So if it's like we always go down the right, then we go inside, you know, we can see what predictable play looks like. And a lot of the time you can watch a game of football and predict about 90% of the passes. The interesting thing is, is the concept, the whole concept of a third man run is the stuff we've got to coach into our kids because it doesn't matter, you know, a third man run is always going to be effective in a game of football. Um, but there's other concepts as well, weren't there, about, um, Paul was saying about height, width, depth. Well, again, if, you, if you've got height, width, depth in a team, whether it's a pacey winger out there or, 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 or an inverted winger that's going to drift inside like a Grealish, you still need all these elements. You need someone to be pulling them out. You need to be someone pulling them backwards, like dropping a bit of depth. And it needs to be people pushing on the end line. Because if you ain't got a Vardy or, or someone willing, whether it's a winger like a David Villa or a Vardy over the shoulder, you ain't got people pushing and you can't get the rest of it. You can't get the, the creativity and the connectivity and stuff. But it's really interesting the stuff about what tools do you use as well? So there's this obsession, I think, with 
you hear a lot of coaches, especially at grassroots, pass, pass quick, pass quick, pass quick, one, two touch, one, two touch. But when you look at the best players that are real um, controllers of the game, and you know, real orchestrators of the game, they all play three, four, five touches very often in the game. Even like John Stones the other day, I'm watching him, I'm thinking, I'm just going to see how many times he has more than one touch. And then you see him players have three, four, five, and it, and it, and you know why they're doing it. And people think, yeah, play quicker, play quicker. They're taking control of the game. They're, they know that's what the game needs. And then for the next five minutes, everyone might be on one touch. And it's just about developing that skill within the players. Okay, don't just watch them. Why? Why are they doing it? Why are we doing the free man weave today? Because I'm a big fan of it as well. I, I first learned it at basketball at school. It's interesting, Paul said there, when I was at school, I weren't particularly good at basketball, but I remember doing a free man weave as a drill. And it's something I use quite a lot in my coaching as well, even as a basic warm-up. But people would look at it and think it's just a technical drill sort. But like you and Paul said a minute ago, there is so much skill involved. If I'm in the middle now and I'm not the best runner and I am a Busquets doing a three-man weave and I've got two absolute Ferraris alongside me, I'm going to affect the flow of it in terms of my speed that I can get on the overlap. I've then got my decision-making effect affected by if they get there quicker, I might have to punch this pass in a bit quicker ahead of them. You know, there's so much skill involved, even in a technical session, if we get this stuff right. And I think that's the stuff we've got to start coaching into kids is do they understand the concept do you understand why we're doing this do you, do you know what i mean whether it's the third man running concept or the three man with why why are we doing this and really build on that i think that's that's what needs to be built over years and years interesting so let's uh got to wrap this up now i think because um almost ready to see the master of flow guardiola and tuchel tonight to the to the absolute le legends of uh, team and individual flow so paul look we're waiting for this nice polished little you know uh, paperback version of flow coming out in the next few weeks right for all coaches to purchase uh i'm looking forward to this this new philosophy of yours uh, i don't think it's anything new it's just it's just a different way of looking at it i think whether it whether it helps or not um i don't know i think i think what we have to do is look from the player's eye view so can he see that can he see that flow? Can he see that opposite flow? Is it a takeover in the middle of midfield? Is it a back heel where he goes against the flow, where he understands he's going and stopping and the guy's going past him and he's really enjoying that, that he's got that tool, he's, he's got that understanding. I mean, the last little one is he's also like the top players like Glenn So, and if you watch them closely, they are using disguise all the time because everybody else is reading what they should be doing because they're all top players. So at the last second, it might be someone moves to intercept and now they disguise and let the ball run. Um, or, or it might be they hold it longer. So again, Michael Carrick was talking about, well, why would I pass it to the fullback? I know he's there. He's my get out ball. Why would I just play it to him? I hold it a bit longer, hold it a bit longer. And now the, the fullback moves over closer to the, to our winger and now I can look as though I'm going to play it, you know, with flow. Everything says it's going to flow with a pass mm. towards the, the winger's, um, you know, safe side. And then at the last second, as the fullback goes towards him, you reverse it inside him and you've changed the flow. You've beaten the, you've beaten the, you've beaten the, the fullback by an illusion of flow. It's going one way and then it goes the other. And Jim Ryan used to call it small, late movements. You've got to make it look like that pass till the very last second or or that shot until the last second. Sometimes it's just a, a reaction to someone blocking you or doing something, but sometimes it's really it's thought out. They know exactly what they're doing. They're coming inside to look like they're shooting, to chop back and bang. You know, people like Grealish and, and mm. Mares, particularly those sort of people, uh, Saka. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, just reminded me on that last one, Saka, they're doing a beautiful one with White and Saka when he's sort of he's he's on the line. They're moving, say, just over the halfway line. And then mm. just he bursts inside and he plays a little sort of slightly reverse pass into his path yeah. um, to get him off the line. He's it's a beautiful play. I really love it. It's uh, yeah, been I a think... feature of their play this year. Yeah, I think as well. It's just I think it's good useful just for coaches to look at it sort of differently, isn't it? Be a bit reflective mm -hmm. and understand what I'm looking for. Like you say, flow. I mean, I, when I look, watch a lot of games, I watch them differently. Particularly if I'm watching one of the players I'm working with, I'm watching particularly on the one v one duels. What's happening individually with those battles and those around the pitch and. You know, I was watching uh, Lavia for Southampton quite a lot recently in terms of way he cuts and that sort of thing. Just looking at the game differently. So rather than that, you know, 11 v 11, you know, we're looking at the you know, the phases or the three thirds of the pitch 
you know, maybe yeah. looking, focusing when you talk about your like, you know, your tool as well is really important and really sort of useful. We're trying to really look at those individual moments as well. Those those individual battles, those individual flows or those 2v2s, those 2v1s and those things. And then also the bigger picture as well. So I suppose yeah. having different sort of lenses on lenses yeah you've got, got to have three play, lenses right? at least yeah, yeah. so say so, look this is it this is the game this is the patterns of play which is a team of player but then this is what's happening individually how do they break that down and what are those movements where that was you know where that was happening i think that's really sort of interesting for coaches as well but listen we could talk yeah. here all night about this but paul yeah. thanks very much for, for joining us Cheers, and friend. enjoy Cheers. your Cheers, enjoy your trip to northern ireland all those lucky coaches over there are going to see you uh, yeah, see you watching and glenn a pleasure thanks for having you again mate been a pleasure and uh Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this special, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thanks, guys.